Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Sage Whitson, and on behalf of the University of California, I want to thank you for joining us uh, and joining the UC Alumni Career Network Seminar. Um, again, I'm uh, Sage Nigel Whitson. I'm an associate professor in the departments of Black Study and Dance, uh, and I'm honored to be moderating this webinar and to be uh, in conversation with some incredible people and colleagues. This, this program is a part of the UC-wide effort to unite and support alumni across ten, our 10 campuses. Throughout this session, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions uh, of the speakers by clicking on the Q&A button on your screen. If you forget that, we have folks that are monitoring the uh, comment section as well, but so you can, can use both, but we encourage you to please use questions in the Q&A. Um, and we'll try to answer as many as we can during this event. It will be a, a pretty firm hour, so we'll try to get to as many as we, we can. The discussion today is focused on gender at work. This panel will share experiences and insights along with tangible tips and advice to help you gain a greater understanding on creating a safe, inclusive, equitable workplace for transgender and non-binary employees. Panelists will be speaking from their own experiences and their knowledges, and not all experiences and knowledges of all trans and non-binary people. This uh, topic is important to me, um, and I said yes to being a part of this conversation because I'm Black and transgender. Um, I'm an artist that is working across platforms uh, and very much center Black trans embodiedness in my, in my work. Um, I also have experienced, unfortunately, trans antagonism, uh, gender-based discrimination, and anti-Blackness in the workplace. So I am here to be a part of conversations that will move us into a future where these conversations hopefully are no, no longer needed, uh, but to also ensure that we are centering folks who are most vulnerable in those conversations and that we do them with care. And I have a lot of trust and faith that this, this panel here will be able to do that with us. Um, they will lead us in that effort. I'd love to introduce them to you. Uh, first, we have uh, Andy Cofino, who uses the pronouns he, him, and his, and has more than a decade's worth of experience supporting LGBTQIA plus communities. He currently serves as the director of the, for the UCLA LGBTQ Campus Resource Center after previously serving roles at Princeton University, New York University, and on the executive board of the National Consortium of Higher Education LGBT Resource Professionals. His work includes consulting staff, faculty, students, and senior administrators on policies related to sexual and romantic orientation, gender identity, sexual harassment, and hate crime slash bias related incidents. He leads advocacy efforts to improve university systems, policies, and climate for LGBTQIA plus students, staff, and faculty. Andy holds a Bachelor of Arts in English and Women's and Gender Studies with a minor in Italian from Pace University and a Master of Arts in LGBTQ Studies, Social Justice, and Creative Writing from New York University. Andy has, has done some things, if you haven't gotten that from what I'm saying. He's currently pursuing his MBA at UCLA's Anderson School of Management. M, who has also done some things, M Huang, uh, pronouns they them, is the director of LGBTQ plus advancement and equity at the University of California, Berkeley. They work to advance queer and trans community policy and advocacy in higher education through an intersectional lens with their experiences as a queer, trans, and non-binary East and Southeast Asian American, informing their passion for social justice, education, and advocacy particularly focused on marginalized communities. Their work involves leading advocacy efforts to improve university and system-wide policies and practices that impact LGBTQ plus students, faculty, and staff, developing and implementing programming and initiatives to address community needs and advising campus organizations, stakeholders, and individuals around issues of gender and sexuality. M earned their BA in sociology 
with minors in gender studies, psychology, and natural science at the University of, of South, Southern California, and their MED in higher education and student affairs administration at the University of Vermont. Rick Davis is the regional director of the Western Regional Office for Lambda Legal, the oldest and largest national legal organization committed to achieving full recognition of the civil rights of lesbians, gay men, bisexuals, transgender people, and people with HIV. He is responsible for expanding Lambda Legal's organizational reach in 11 Western states with a focus on strategic planning, financial development, and educational and media efforts. Davis received a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science at the University of California, Riverside. He then studied law at the University of California, Los Angeles, where he holds a Juris Doctor degree. Very busy, very important, very phenomenal people that we get to, to hear from today. Thank you all for being present. And I, I'm eager to dive into our conversation. Um, but just a little like how you do and check out loud before that, do you y'all want to just check in? How you doing? Excited to be here. Same here, really looking forward to the conversation with us. Go UC, glad to be here, glad we're doing this. Phenomenal, thank you so, so much. Um, how about we start off with an, inv an introduction from you all about your roles, uh, the, the roles that you play, how you identify uh, and why this topic is important to you. Uh, let's start, let's start with M. Hi everyone, as mentioned, my name is M, they, them pronouns, and uh, as noted, I'm the director of LGBTQ Advancement and Equity at UC Berkeley. Um, so what that really means is that I'm the campus LGBTQ director, um, and so I'm essentially the main point person on campus uh, to support our entire campus, not just students, but thinking about faculty, staff, alums, really anyone who interfaces with our campus around issues of gender and sexuality. So for me, that really looks like everything from direct uh, individual support for folks, whether that's students who are trying to navigate resources, staff members who might be experiencing discrimination, um, but also doing things like developing different uh, programming and initiatives to serve the different needs of our communities, um, because those are ever changing, ever shifting, and those are things that uh, are really important to keep a pulse on. Um, but I also care a lot about policy and advocacy work. So th thinking about things like how can we uh, implement or change policies that might be uh, inequitable or harming our communities, or how do we you know, create more spaces for our communities uh, that we often don't have spaces or might be invisibilized in different ways. Um, so I think all of those are some of the parts of my work. Um, but in, in particular, why this is important to me. So I'm somebody who is trans, non-binary, um, I'm queer, I'm East and Southeast Asian American. Those are all things that impact and influence how I navigate the world and particularly how I navigate the world in my work. And so having, you know, as a trans and non-binary staff member, I've both witnessed um, other people experience and also witnessed, uh, experienced a lot myself of things that are barriers to whether it's my actual, uh, my work, right? When folks are trying to get in the way of my work because I am somebody who is trans and non-binary fighting for things that impact trans and non-binary people. Um, but it, it can also look like uh, barriers that people may not actually be doing on purpose, right? Things that are inequitable even just by design, uh, but even though folks may not see it as such or think of it as such, those are still often things that impact um, how I can experience the world and how I can show up as a staff member. So all those things are, I think, pieces where I think about how gender and how we think about the ways that it impacts our work, um, how we think about not just inclusion, but actually addressing equity. How do we actually set up spaces? How do we create things for success beyond just equality? All of those are really important to me and why I'm part of this space today. Thank you. How about you, Rick? So uh, Rick Davis, he, him. Uh, pronouns. I am, as stated, the Western Regional Director for Lambda Legal. Um, that covers the 11 Western states of the United States. We are a national organization. Uh, been around next year will be our 50th uh, year. Um, the, I come to this particular conversation um, as, yes, a panelist and participant, 
participant, but also just so excited uh, to be on the panel with such great minds and thought leaders on the subject. Uh, I do come as an ally and I, um, my interest here, just in, in addition, uh, my, well, my professional interest, uh, which we'll talk about is really in the legal uh, realm. Um, the reality is for the broader LGBTQ plus movement um, that many of the advances that have taken place have come through most, if not all, have come through court prodding and a uh, lawsuit. Um, that is not to take away um, the work that is done by our partners in other parts of the community, because it is important to, for, as M said, to advance public policy. And one of the ways you do that is uh, changing hearts and minds. Uh, there are organizations that do that, uh, but, um, you know, not everyone's heart and mind can be changed. And for that, we have lawsuits and uh, we try and force people to act right. Um, so my interest here is um, also, in addition to uh, the allyship, is also recognizing that um, while some of the arguments uh, that are advanced against um, the trans and gender nonconforming communities uh, may seem new and just to have appeared, um, they really go back for millennia and they have been used against um, all of the letters of the community in just different forms. So we bring the experience and my interest is making sure that experience is deployed in a way which turns aside some of the arguments that uh, we'll get into a little more against uh, the advances that we're trying to make in protecting uh, particularly transgender nonconforming folks uh, in the space of working and employment, which is fundamental to human dignity. And uh, if you can't feed yourself and your family, um, it is very hard to advance other interests in your life. And so I'm so glad that we're taking on this particular issue um, because there's much work to be done and we'll, we'll talk about what's been done and what can be done. So thank you for allowing me to be here. Thank you, Rick. Andy. Hi, everybody. Andy Cafino, he and pronouns. I'm so thrilled to be here and in such good company with such amazing people. So I'm really delighted. Um, uh, what brings me to this work, I have a very similar role, a counterpart role to M at UCLA. So I'm the director of the LGBTQ Campus Resource Center there. And so our center provides resources, direct service, advising, programming, um, as well as advocacy related work through our center. So a lot of my role is really looking at what are ways that we can create a more inclusive environment for LGBTQ plus Bruins at UCLA? And part of that conversation is how to create a more inclusive campus specifically for transgender and non-binary folks. And so that is something that is professionally um, top of mind and also personally. I identify as a man of trans experience. Um, I'm also bisexual. Um, I identify as white, Italian, Sicilian American. I identify as a person with a disability. So all of these things really inform the way that I move through the workplace, the way that I move through institutions and the places where I may have access, where I can use my positionality to advance um, different issues, including LGBTQ inclusion, but also, as M spoke about, also areas where there are barriers, where there still are a lot of area, areas of growth to provide greater inclusion for our community members. And I'm also impacted by that personally as well. Uh, I also, in my last institution, before I was at UCLA, I was at Princeton University for a bit of time. And when I was there, I was one of the first openly transgender staff members to transition while on the job. So I learned firsthand what the experience is like to be in an environment in a workplace and go through the process of transition. And I learned a lot there about what are policy changes that can be made, what are areas in the um, opportunities in the areas of representation. When we think about who are the trans non-binary folks, where are they in our institutions? How can we best support them? These are the kind of conversations that I feel like uh, lend itself to thinking um, more and more intentionally about inclusive workplace environments. So I'm really thrilled to be here today. Yes, yes. Thank you all for that. Um, this next question kind of is a bit of an anchoring point for us to, if we can kind of project ourselves into what we hope is a near future of, of, of equity in, in the workplace. Um, you know, if we could wave our, our fairy wands uh, over 
the workplace, what would, what would that equity look like? What, how does it actually function um, in practice? And we can begin anywhere. How about we begin with Rick? Well, um, equity um, to me uh, uh, really in practice means in the context of employment, being able to bring your true and full self to your employment situation without fear of retaliation or discrimination. Um, and, um, you know, I, using, um, using the term equity, I, I do need to call out that in particular in the employment situation, um, um, the discrimination that hits the uh, trans and gender non-conforming community as a whole, which is deep and broad, truly falls upon those with intersectional identities, particularly uh, racial and ethnic minorities, black and brown folks, uh, truly take some of the hardest uh, places, uh, some of the hardest discrimination uh, in a way where the resources to respond to that uh, because of uh, race or socioeconomic status is not as broadly based. Um, um, so I, I really believe when we, we're talking about equity, we're not just talking about white collar equity. We're talking about um, you know, minimum wage workers and the ability for folks to be able to step up and support themselves in and pushing for laws that recognize that not everyone can go into years long court case and continue to feed themselves and their families while they're fighting while, while they're fighting for dignity so trying to make sure that we have broad based um, policies that are easily implemented easily understood by the folks that it's trying to help and the folks that we're trying to hold responsible for their actions in uh, being responsible employers that are following the law. And that's, that's my vision. Andy. Sure, I mean, I think Rick just um, really said such an important point here. And when we look at the, the data, what we know, particularly I think about employment, I think about unemployment, right? I think about the workplace, I think about unemployment. If you look at, for example, the National Transgender Discrimination Survey, you'll find that specifically Black trans folks had an extremely high unemployment rate of 26%. That's um, two times the rate of overall trans folks who don't identify as Black and four times the rate of the general population. So we have to approach the work when we're looking at inclusion, where we're thinking about equity, how does race and ethnicity and in tandem, racism and anti-Blackness play a role in the decisions that are being made in boardrooms, right, in uh, critical conversations that are impacting people's everyday experience. And so I think that is such an important point that um, is absolutely crucial for us to engage in this conversation. So not only are we interrogating how is gender identity and gender expression um, being uh, allowed to, there being an expression around that and the ability to people, for folks to show up authentically, but also how are structures set up to support everybody, particularly around race and ethnicity? What are the systems that are not allowing, for example, Black folks, Black trans folks to be employed? It's not because of um, the individuals. It's not because of the Black trans populations. It's because of the systems that we have set up that are anti-Black and that are transphobic. And so really taking a very um, concentrated effort at addressing those issues is going to create a better workplace, a more inclusive workplace for everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, at first off, I just really want to appreciate both what uh, Rick and Andy shared. I think a lot about how, um, when we're talking about equity, we often, and a lot of this work, when it comes to DIV work, often ends up focusing on, oh, well, here's this individual person who's experiencing these challenges. How are we going to fix this one person's situation without actually thinking about, well, if there's one person experiencing this, there's probably at least 10, 20 more who just haven't been able to either share that, be, have that be heard, have that not be uh, dismissed or invisibilized, right? And so really going back to that piece of what are we doing in these systematic or institutional levels to address these different pieces that come up? 
Um, when I think about equity in, in practice in particular, uh, so, so something I often talk with, for example, different departments on our campus about are, what are the different ways that we're looking at what this looks like for you? So the three things that I usually ask to folks to think about are, what's the infrastructure looking like? Are there actually systems um, set up in place to support folks and actually make their experiences um, you know, without barriers. And that includes things like literally physical infrastructure, right? Like facilities. Do you have gender inclusive restrooms nearby easily accessible to folks where you're not having to travel, you know, 15, 20 minutes just to find a restroom, right? Just a very basic, simple one. But also do you have policies and practices that allow for folks to exist and again, navigate your institution or your, uh, or your company or whatever that is without having to experience additional barriers such as do you have lived name policies where you don't have to be outed um, or dead named or misgendered consistently, right? Things like that. Um, I ask folks to think about responsive measures, right? When things happen, when people are impacted by something, whether it's by misgendering or dead naming or, you know, some other form of impact, are there actually clear ways that folks can be uh, cared for when they're impacted by that? Are there ways that folks who are causing harm are held accountable and also uh, being actually doing better after that thing happens, right? Is there actually responsive things that are taken seriously by everyone involved? I also ask folks to think about proactively, right? What is being, what is happening in those spaces to ensure that folks are not just uh, there, right? But also celebrated, recognized that their, uh, that their contributions, that their experiences are held and not just during Pride Month, for example, right? It's not just one post uh, during June to recognize trans and queer people, but rather what are the different ways that uh, our stories, our experiences, our spaces are being visibilized and held and, and ensured that folks are, have, have connections to those things, right? Are resources being shared out to folks so that they don't just have to seek it out and, for example, out so that somebody doesn't have to out themselves to be able to receive resources and support around, say, accessing healthcare as a trans employee, right? Things like that. So those are some of the different ways that I look at and try to think about um, what that equitable workplace can actually look like. In Thank you all. And I think you've moved us into another part of the conversation that could be really useful. Um, can you give some examples of where you've seen people answer those questions, uh, some of those questions that you pose around policies and practices or, or, or methodologies of care that, um, that have been successful or transformative for, for a workplace environment? Um, yeah, have you witnessed folks able to to answer that in a way that has has been transformative. Oof, I'll say sometimes. Uh, I think that there's a lot of, and, and something that I'm really thankful for, I think particularly at Cal is that I work with a lot of folks who really want to support people. And I think there are folks who have really good intentions and just may not always have quite the specific knowledge and experience to implement that in a particular way, but are really open to doing that work. I think that's one one piece of that puzzle. I think a lot of the tangible things that, that lead to that are things like, one, who are we thinking of as our imagined, uh, so in, at, at Cal we often talk about who's our imagined student. right? And I think when we extrapolate this to the workplace context, it's thinking about who's our imagined employee. Right? What are the identities and experiences that that person holds? And how are we considering those as we develop our policies and practices in response to that, right? So if we're only assuming that our employees are cis, straight, white, you know, things like that, and able-bodied, uh, neurotypical, right? We're only going to create policies and practices that serve that population. So I think one of those first pieces is as we're developing those policies and practices, who are we thinking about? Who are we bringing into those conversations and developing that work with to ensure that it's actually meeting those Needs. I think when folks are doing that, that is when I have seen that be some of the most successful in response to actually creating those spaces for people. I guess that's one piece of that. But I'm curious to hear other folks as well. Yeah, maybe we can have our other panelists also speak to that. Where have you seen um, these kinds of questions around care, infrastructures, or policies be implemented in ways that are unique or different or, or what have you seen that needs to be necessary to maybe move those places into that kind of uh, transformational being, futuring? I'll let Andy uh, follow on in uh, with the practicalities and then I can, I can uh, come in and talk about some of the responsibilities and rights act right. Sure. I mean, I think I can think of one specific example where I had a non-binary student who was in a biology class 
and felt like the curriculum was not inclusive of intersex folks and non-binary folks and the expansiveness that we are aware of as it relates to sex and gender. And the individual brought this to the attention of the faculty member. And the response was that the faculty member did not ask for further information from the student. The faculty member took it upon herself to review her entire syllabus and curriculum and update the language to be inclusive. And that was a very transformative experience that took obviously effort on her part to do that, um, but she was delighted to do that. And the response afterwards was overwhelmingly positive on behalf of our students. It didn't require additional time or labor on behalf of our students to make the change, even though they had to raise the issue. But that was an example of something very powerful that now we can also reference on our campus for other folks, particularly who are in STEM fields, who want to update some of their language in their, in their own curriculum to have an example of how you can do that in a thoughtful, uh, in a thoughtful way. Thank you for that. If you, before you um, offer it, uh, Rick, I wonder, Andy, if you could expand a little bit on that, um, because I think you're, you're starting to talk about the ways that folks who maybe are without more um, institutional power can impact institutional change. Um, are there other ways that you uh, have seen that happen or that you encourage that? To Absolutely. Happen? Yeah, I think the biggest question for all of us, regardless of what access to power you have in the institution or in your organization, is to understand what is your sphere of influence. And it may be you're a direct service provider and you're working one on one with folks who are coming into the space. It could be that you're a CEO and you have a lot of influence and power. It could be that you're a middle manager. What is your sphere, right? It could be that you are having dinner with your friends and that is your sphere of influence for that evening. Consider what is your sphere of influence? And how can you influence that sphere, that community that you are connected to, to create further equity and change? And it could be by raising a question, it could be by re being responsive to what community is actually requesting that they need support around, which is something that I would advocate for. But we all have a sphere of influence, right? Another example of this could be you're organizing a program. Make sure that when you're planning your program and you're organizing and you're inviting people to that program, where are the gender inclusive restrooms? Ensure that you're mentioning that in addition to the gendered restrooms. To M's point, if we want to, if we want to take this framework from you know a universal design perspective, if we always assume that there are people with disabilities in this space, then it won't be an add-on later when we need to get an accessible ramp, right? You're always thinking about who is not in the room, who is in the room, and how to be most thoughtful for those folks, assuming that they're already here always. And when we can do that, that is when we get to more of the practical, tangible things um, that can help move and drive the work forward. But everybody has a sphere of influence. And so it's about really sitting with that, understanding where you actually can inform change, and then actually taking the step to create an action um, in that space or that environment to better the communities that you're trying to serve. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, and Rick, with your sphere of influence, including the legal, <laughs> could you talk with us about you know what protections and policies are in place on a state and federal level uh, that employees oh. should be aware of? Thank you, Sage. Uh, my sphere of influence in the legal world is it's very limited, but uh, um, what I I do um, want to just sort of build on here is making sure uh, whether you come at this from self-interest uh, or an allyship, um, really making sure word gets out about the basic levels of responsibility that people are entitled to in the workplace. Uh, because there are laws and rules that govern um, the respect, quite frankly, that people should be given irregardless of gender identity um, or expression. Um, just, I'm not going to go through, you know, in, in two minutes, a, a total legal synopsis here. I uh, would certainly recommend, uh, if it is an area of interest, um, that you seek additional information and educate yourself about what laws and regulations are out there in regards to your particular jurisdictions. I know the majority of folks here are from California, so uh, some of my comments are going to be directed there. Um, but you know, we do have people from around the country on the, on the call. Um, and I wanna recognize that also. So not everything is going to be obviously hit in a minute or two, but uh, I encourage you, Lambda Legal, 
we have our website, lambdalegal.org. Uh, and under our work, it talks both about our transgender uh, and gender non-conforming work, as well as our employment work. Uh, so if you have questions there, there are resources there. Uh, we also maintain a help desk, which you can access through um, the website for individual issues. So unfortunately today, we may not be able to, we most likely will not be able to answer individual employment questions, um, but uh, we have attorneys there and we welcome those inquiries. Um, I also wanna call out um, the work in particular of our sister organizations. We work in a coalition with other uh, LGBTQ groups that offer similar benefits, specifically in this instance, um, the wonderful work being done by our sister organization, the Transgender Law Center, and they have a wonderful website. And I encourage you also to seek uh, their, their counsel on frequently asked questions, as well as seek uh, assistance uh, through their help, help facilities. So uh, there are resources out there. I apologize, we're not going to get to everything and I'm not, and I'm just going to skim very briefly over uh, some of the high points of employment law to set, set the foundation. Basically, um, as most people know, uh, most of the states in this country do not have uh, uh, employment non-discrimination laws for either LGBTQ uh, people, um, the, um, as well as other um, uh, non-discrimination laws. There is an act in Congress right now uh, called the Equality Act, which has uh, passed the House and is installed in the Senate, which uh, would codify uh, those broader non-discrimination laws um, in, into, um, into public policy, it is stalled currently. And you know that, that is another discussion about how that moves forward. Um, however, there in the realm of employment, uh, and I single employment out from public accommodations or credit um, or other areas of, of protection, in the realm of employment, uh, there are protections, uh, both here at the, in California at the state law, at, at the state level, as well as federal protections. So just quickly, here in California, there is um, uh, the California Gender Non-Discrimination Act, which codified some of the uh, previous laws that were already on the books regarding uh, trans and gender non-conforming folks. Uh, and in 2012, wrapped that up into a, a very strong bow, which means that uh, employees have the right to be respected uh, on, regardless of their gender identity um, or, or status. It, it is uh, very deep and we have our own state agency that it helps enforce it. So you can bring the power of the government to help uh, on state matters and enforcing uh, non-discrimination. Um, on the federal level, however, as I said, in the employment realm, not all is lost. In, uh, in 2020, uh, the Supreme Court, a very conservative Supreme Court, mind you, found in the case of Bostock um, that uh, the, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which provided for sex discrimination um, uh, bar, which barred sex discrimination on, on the basis of sex, uh, extended to both sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, this is huge because that covers the entirety of the United States. And this is the word we're trying to get out to people right now, um, that uh, there are levels of protection that are out there that the Supreme Court has ruled are available to keep people from being actively discriminated against in their workplaces. Now, I mentioned our help desk earlier. Over half the calls Lambda Legal receives, and those can reach up to 7,000 calls a year from our community, over half of those are in the field of employment. It is real and it is out there. Um, so 
know, letting people know that they have rights in this, in this situation, and most people feel, unfortunately, that they don't have any ability to fight back is important. So um, basically, the Supreme Court said, um, sex, it, you, you can't, uh, that sex discrimination is, it, you cannot treat people differently because of, obviously of their sex. It reaches into the field of gender identity in the fact that uh, on basically on two, two fronts, sex stereotyping, that just because you believe a man should act or behave in a certain way or a woman should act or behave in a certain way, that is not permitted under the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And if you act on that and you force someone to act in a particular gendered way, um, that, that counts as discrimination. Um, similarly, uh, if you would treat a person differently because of a, they were either a man or a woman, uh, or your perception of what that should, should consist of, whether it's as basic as you can do this job or that job, all the way to you need to wear this clothing or that clothing, uh, that is also not allowed. So um, that provides a, a, the basic foundation. And again, it goes much deeper than this, um, but it provides an opening. And we've been working on this for about 14 years uh, prior to this, this, uh, this ruling, but it provides the first tangible benefit for people in different parts of the country to access protections. Now, again, not everyone has the resources or the ability to uh, access those protections. So the getting the word out is important, that, this, that there are protections out there, getting in contact with organizations for people who may not have the financial means or the resources or the knowledge uh, to sort of help them through the process is important. So we encourage people to do that. Um, um, as with everything else, and we've certainly seen this, um, there is a resistance out there. So it is not perfect. It is not codified into law. It is a Supreme Court ruling. So what the Supreme Court gives, the Supreme Court, as we uh, just recently saw in the abortion issues in the Dobbs case, can take away. And um, they did leave some uh, opportunities that you may hear rumblings about on, on lower, that are working their way through the lower courts right now to try and scale back or take or, or limit that ruling. Uh, they basically fall into two flavors. The first flavor is um, basically uh, Justice Gorsuch in writing the opinion said, when, uh, yes, it is sex, uh, sexual orientation and gender identity are sex discrimination, but we are not reaching um, the questions of pronouns, bathrooms, misgendering, dead names, where we're, we're all that is going to work its way through the courts. So does that mean that someone, in our mind, and what we're arguing is that, yes, showing respect for people at work and not discrimination and not discriminating against them means that you have to reach those issues to make it a comfortable and acceptable workplace for everyone. There are people who are claiming that, you know, it is, uh, it is not required, uh, it should not be part of sex discrimination that they have to re refer to somebody how they wish to be referred to. So these are working their way through the courts. The second last point I'll make is, and you'll see this over and over again because it is a particularly important um, concept for our opponents that they're taking on right now, is putting forth the idea of religious exemptions or the license to discriminate uh, as we're thinking of it, meaning yes, go ahead and have your rights if you must, but do not force me to honor or recognize those. And uh, we're seeing this in many categories, but it, it plays here saying that if I uh, do not believe or my religion teaches that I should not have, uh, believe that the scientific fact is real, uh, then I should not be forced to follow it because it is, goes against my religious consciousness. We do not believe society can operate if everyone gets to opt out of their, um, opt out of the laws on discrimination 
uh, or any other laws because they don't believe in it. If I don't believe, you know, fire extinguishers should be mandatory in buildings because I have something against fire extinguishers, you don't have the right to say, okay, I'm not putting a fire extinguisher in the building. So everyone needs to be forced to act the same. However, the Supreme Court has shown a deference, uh, particularly to a certain brand of conservative, conservative evangelical uh, Christian belief that um, uh, they should be able to exert some of these religious exemptions to opt out. This is again at the very early stages. There, those sort of arguments against the sort of national uh, sentiment and and push toward full employment non-discrimination. It's it's going on, uh, but it's being fought and just want to sort of leave it there. I know this is quick. I know it was choppy uh, because I skipped over a lot. But uh, again, educate yourself. Please encourage people who are experiencing discrimination to reach out for help. It does exist out there. Um, and those are the points I will leave you with on this. Thank you, Rick. We asked you to do a lot and not a lot of time, um, but but thank you for, for giving it a try. And uh, the links that you mentioned are in the chat. And I think that you have done us a great service of trying to condense a, a, a really important and uh, ongoing legal effort. So, so thank you for taking that on. Um, there are a couple of questions that have come in from our audience that I wanted to, to share. A few of them are a little similar, so I'll try to uh, collapse them together. Uh, but some folks are asking um, for advice around um, engaging with and honoring, this came up with, with a Rick statement as well, um, non-binary people in, in their departments and their workplaces. So it's kind of a two-parter. One is, uh, does UC have any trainings or support for folks who are not used to engaging with non-binary pronouns um, and how to do so respectfully? And the second part of that, um, let me find the original language. Um, do you have advice on the best way or best practices when referencing people and you don't know their pronouns? Um, should you assume that people should we always assume people may have pronouns that are different than how they physically present? So two parts, do you see helping people with uh, languaging non-binary um, identities if they're not used to that? And the second, should you assume always uh, and, and how do you do so? Yeah, I'm happy to, to maybe uh, uh, have a go at this one. So I think, so first off, to address the point around training, so each campus, um, uh, basically each campus, I think, except for one of our campuses, has um, somebody in mine and Andy's roles. Um, and so often some of our work includes doing trainings. Um, so that is one resource, and there are also different resources available. Um, I know that some of the campuses have individual uh, trainings around trans and non-binary identities, which includes things around pronouns and things like that. Um, and we're also trying to see if we can adapt some of those to be UC-wide as well, so that that can be more widely available. So that's the training piece there. Um, the other one, um, in terms of addressing folks and pronouns, I would say always, 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 right? Like not, well, basically never assume um, is what my uh, what I would say to folks. And part of it is really around shifting our thought process and our framework, not just around, oh, right, how does somebody quote unquote like assumed to be presented as, but rather just thinking what are what even are our assumptions about how people should right present um, based on gender, based on race, based on all these different things that um, that we have preconceived notions of what somebody looks like, of uh, what a particular identity looks like. Right. And I think a lot of those, if we can shift our ways of thinking about that and not be assuming those things, that actually gives us a better framework to think about this. Because then if we're not assuming, then yeah, we can always just go into a situation right just actually asking somebody what their pronouns are what their name is even if you think you might know and if you're right cool you're right but if you weren't then that you saved yourself from misgendering somebody from um causing harm in a way that 
you know, is, is very avoidable. Um, and so another piece that I've, I've shared with folks is typically if I don't know somebody's pronouns, I just actually use their name if I know their name. If I don't know their name, uh, then, and I, and, and I don't know their pronouns, then I use uh, they, them pronouns or another um, a pronoun that is does not assume gender specifically, but I also caution folks not to get into the habit of just using they them pronouns for everyone, right? Like if somebody doesn't actually use they them pronouns, but you're using those pronouns for that person, you're actually still misgendering them. And so it really is about, um, I think one, not assuming, two, ensuring that you're actually just asking folks and giving them the space and the agency to to share with you what pronouns or, or name that they use, and then three, actually following up on that and ensuring that you're using those correctly. Anyone else want to speak to that? Good, good work there, and <laughs> I agree. I agree. I was like snapping under the table, so I'll bring them up here. Um, another one, kind of related to, I think, a comment that you made earlier, um, and was about. Excuse me, it disappeared. What? Um, even well-meaning, mention that even well-meaning folks can unintentionally ignore or even cause problems for non-binary or trans employees uh, in the day-to-day to, -day to business, uh, business operations. So they're asking if you could give some examples and potential solutions for those. Um, and I think anyone can, can answer that. Both you and, and Andy have really specific um, knowledges around this. I can start things and I'm sure other folks have things to offer. I mean, I think that a few of these um, situations kind of were spoken to about already, but I'm thinking specifically about, for example, this question that I think M raised and that I raised about what are these assumptions that we're making about employees and community members? And if we can start with the assumption that there's always trans non-binary people in a system, then we can begin by setting up systems to be more inclusive. So for example, if we know that there's trans and non-binary folks in your organization or whatnot, um, are we allowing folks to indicate a live name that is different than perhaps their legal name? So that is a simple field that you can provide on a form. Uh, another example of this would be, um, I think about our student interns um, and our team at the center. Um, we don't know what name and pronouns these students might go with, with their parents or their emergency contacts. So when we're gathering emergency contact information for our interns, we allow them the opportunity to indicate what is the name and pronouns that you go by with this emergency contact? Because we would not want in a crisis moment to call their emergency contact and then misgender them, right? Or have some kind of um, conversation regarding gender that the student did not opt into. So those are some things that if you think a little bit more about it and you're very intentional, you can raise those questions. Um, earlier, I mentioned around restrooms, just the basics. You're planning a reoccurring meeting. Make sure the reoccurring meeting is in a space in which there's access to a nearby gender inclusive restroom. Otherwise, you're putting folks on your team in a really awkward position to have to go all the way across a building to be able to access that. Similarly, is it ADA compliant, right? Are there other ways that we can think about also the intersections of folks' identities and the way that they show up in the workplace and to be inclusive um, around those different areas too? Um, other examples with pronouns, right? For example, if you're not allowing folks to share their pronouns, that's, that's a missed opportunity in terms of data collection. Right, allowing folks to optionally, and we're not saying force people to, to share pronouns, but providing the ability for folks to, folks to indicate pronouns allows us the gift of knowing what are the words that people use to describe their own experience that we can honor their pronouns. It really saves us, as Em was describing, it saves us the headache and the, the harm of misgendering somebody when we can just flip something really easily on our own end to ensure that folks have the ability to indicate pronouns if that's something that they choose to do. So those are some sort of basic things that if you approach it from the lens of, I'm assuming that there's already a trans and, non and or non-binary person in the space, you can begin to kind of unpack those um, systems or operational procedures to help support inclusion. Yeah, I appreciate that, Andy. And I think to maybe dig a little deeper in some of those pieces, I think something I've noticed is when and, and it goes back to that assumptions piece, right? When, if we make the assumption that there are always trans and non-binary folks in the space, but I think what's important is to not assume you know who is trans or non-binary and, and or that you assume that you know what trans or non-binary people look like, act like, or you know whatever that means. Trans and non-binary people are incredibly diverse, right? We have so many different ways of existing, of showing up. And you cannot just assume that, oh, this is my picture in my head of what 
um, a trans person looks like, of what a non-binary person looks like. Because if we do that, and then if we act based on those assumptions, that's often where some of that unintentional harm happens, right? So I guess in a, a specific example I can think of is um, saying that, you know, if you, if you have this idea in your head of, oh, this is what a non-binary person looks like, right? So I'm like, oh, well, I think that this person, uh, a non-binary person looks like this and is going to use they, them pronouns. Huh, maybe for this meeting, I'm gonna ask people to share their pronouns, right? So that in the, in essence one, makes an, an assumption that may be incorrect about who somebody is, how they navigate the world. And it also creates a situation where you're actually not creating a culture of inviting folks to share their pronouns consistently so that that's for everyone, right? Not only when you think that there's somebody who uses pronouns that may be different. Um, or things like that. So I think that's one particular way that I see that happening. Um, and similarly with things like bathrooms, right? When you're sharing where bathrooms are, our practice at GenEC is always to share where all of the bathrooms are, right? Both gendered and gender inclusive, so that we're not just assuming based on what we think somebody might use um, as a bathroom. Um, so that way everyone always has access to that information, resources, and so forth. Yes, yes. Thank you all. This, uh, there are two more questions, and I think one is is might be a little more more greedy, so I'll start with that one, and, and hopefully we can get to the, the last one. This one is a resource question. Um, a person from probably UCSD, it's the name that's here, uh, when they were holding vaccinations at the, they were holding vaccinations at the top of a ridiculously steep stairwell and elevators were turned off during the pandemic to quote unquote save electricity. This was reported to those managing the vaccination process and were ignored. This person then sent several emails and never heard back. Um, their, their question is, do you have any suggestions of who they should, she, they should have contacted and how possibly to handle those conversations um, or issues going forward? an equity accessibility question. I mean, I would say if it's a concern around accessibility in terms of you're not able to access the resource, then that could be, you know, whoever your office is, and I'm not sure at UCSD, but there's different offices that manage, for example, reports for um, disability, for example. So it could be reporting that to that proper office, which might be an equity, diversity, and inclusion office. It could also be sending a, an email to the facilities person. I'm not sure who would manage that building and that staircase or that facility but it may also be just following up with that individual to see maybe there was another issue with facilities. That might be the first step. And then if you don't get a response there, that could be something that you would report to your discrimination prevention office or your equity, diversity, and inclusion office if it's an accessibility and little, literally like a physical disability um, in an accessible um, situation. Another question asks, um, uh, follow up to the conversation, uh, the previous question, if their facility doesn't have, only has gendered restrooms, should they address that with the employees? Um, I, e.g., we, we only have gender specific bathrooms at this point, but how, how do they, uh, how do they engage that conversation or, or problematic? Um, yeah, I can maybe start on this one. So I would say yes, always provide information to folks so that they can make their own decisions and choices. And I think something to think about is also knowing that this may actually impact somebody's viability as like in terms of their um, their access to, again, basic needs as part of work, right? So I know that for me, I have to think about, okay, if I'm going to a particular institution working there, are there, again, bathrooms for me to access? And if not, is this actually somewhere I want to work? And I think those are very real questions that folks often have to contend with. And I think that one, being upfront about the limitations and restrictions and barriers that folks may face is really important so that folks can make the decisions that are best for them. And I think it's also an impetus for, for y'all to do that work around, hey, can we get some restrooms changed? Can we get some restrooms either added, converted to gender inclusive? And sometimes, right, even if there may not be full recourse for changing you know, a massive construction project or something like that, what are some other creative ways that y'all can get those changed? Maybe it's at least, right, if you have an event in a space, sometimes what we do is we'll say, hey, we're having an event in a space that doesn't have gender inclusive restrooms. Can we work with the building managers of that space to at least de designate bathrooms in that space as gender inclusive for the event, right? At least for a, a time, right? It may not be a perfect solution, but at least it's some work that's being done to create a little bit more access in the meantime until more permanent solutions can be made. 
I would just throw in a little uh, legal tidbit for folks who are not in the know, although if you've been out in a restaurant, uh, you may already know this, that California several years ago passed a law that single stall uh, restrooms need to be gender inclusive and not uh, gender specific, so open to all. Um, surprisingly, you will still go into places that are not aware of that or do not have the signage that reflects that. Um, and sometimes you can you can bring that up with uh, direct again, I would bring it up directly with uh, the proprietor of the organization, but you can also uh, bring it up with your local uh, your local rights commissions uh, or uh, even to the state uh, for um, either the attorney general's office or others to uh, seek enforcement or and oftentimes it just takes a letter. Uh, reminding folks who may not may not know, quite frankly, the update of the law. So, just just a suggestion in the broader uh, world, at least here in in California. So, thanks. Thank you for that, Rick. And um, I do. There are more coming in, which usually happens as we're closing, right? <laughs> but I wanted to. Um, as we're thinking of closing for this moment, if there are resources that you didn't get to share yet, uh, please, you can, can offer that to us. And there was a question that came in about um, maybe the, the psychological uh, and emotional impact or impacts that might be happening right now as there uh, are these advances that you know, Rick spoke to, to that, um, that have been historic, right, against LGBTQIA plus peoples. Um, but is, are there, is there advice, are there maybe pearls of wisdom you can offer as folks are in, in experiencing the emotional impact of, of these assaults against transgender and non-binary identities or any other resources that you can offer that maybe we didn't speak to? I mean, I can begin by just offering, similar to how I was describing the sphere of influence, I also feel like understanding and, and interpreting your own sphere of what re-energizes you, what fills your cup, right? What are those practices? Because for some of us, we are activists, we are advocates, we want to be on the front lines, we want to be creating change, and that is what fills our cup because we do that in community and we know that we are moving towards a broader goal. And for some of us, that means disconnecting, turning off social media, turning off the TV, right? All of us are going to be different. And so really, I don't have a wish I had a Band-Aid solution to all of the work that's happening, but unfortunately, this is the, the reality of the world. And so I think each of us need to tap into and really honor that which brings us joy and that which brings us the resiliency that we'll need to move past these moments in our lives. And so that's gonna look different for everybody. And then two quick resources that I did wanna highlight that I think are great, if, especially folks who are more into media or TV, film, things like that. There's a really great episode of John Stewart, The Problem on Gender that was just released on Apple TV. It's, it's actually free, if you, even if you don't have a subscription, I would check that out, really great resource to watch. And then there's a fantastic uh, documentary that was produced by Laverne Cox called Disclosure on Netflix. If you're interested in the history of trans and non-binary representation in media and film, there's also a lot of social history in there. I would also recommend that as a great resource. Um, I, I, um, I mean, the emotional toll is real uh, from the attacks. There were over 300 bills advanced this year in most state, in many state legislatures, 28 actually, um, that were anti-LGB. And the majority of those were specifically aimed at our transgender community. And um, that takes a toll. And some of them are just mean-spirited. Uh, it's not just Florida and Texas, it's much more broadly based and it does take its toll. Um, it is an odd statement, but to the but this is National Coming Out Day, and um, one of um, one thing that our uh, opponents count on is that many people, well, most people in the United States will now say that they know a lesbian or gay person. Uh, most folks will say that they do not know anyone who's transgender. And therefore, their 
only context may be what they read in social media or see on Fox News, which you can imagine is not positive or supportive. And to the extent um, folks have the ability to, um, to come out basically and talk about the reality of their experience, not a caricature, or, uh, but uh, the actual day-to-day, -day, um, it does make a difference in public policy discussions in, uh, in disclosures for, and it makes a difference in self-representation for people to pick up the flag and represent themselves uh, in these debates. Um, uh, that is not to uh, undercut the needs of allies to speak up and be present, but uh, to the extent that Americans and the rest of the world really get to know uh, transgender and gender um, non-conforming folks personally, um, that's how you build a movement and how you change the tide. Um, and uh, it makes other things possible, but it's not easy. So, uh, and it's not always safe. Um, and like we said, there are people who will come for your job, law or no law. Um, so uh, personal decisions have to be made and there's no judgment as to how those are made, but um, it helps to build, uh, to ha not have people saying, I don't know anyone like that. And everything I see is the cartoon that is presented on Fox, so. Thank you, thank you so much, Rick. And will you, you close us out with that? with those final thoughts? Sure, yeah, um, really quickly. I think, and, and I think I, I address this a little bit more to the trans and non-binary folks on this call. Like, when I think about histories of queer and trans rights and movements, we know that rights are so tenuous, right? Can be given, taken away based on whoever's sitting in a particular seat. And so while I think that legislation and policy are so important and they are not the end all be all, right? They're not the end all be all of our humanity, of our existence, that is separate from that and that is, and that is distinct. And I think the reminders for me that keep me going are being in community, is always being in community and being with people who are going to affirm and see and celebrate and validate who I am, who my people are, who my communities are. And so for me, that is really what holds holds me in this work um, and how we play the long game. You know, it's doing the work in the policy ends, in the organizing ends, but always doing so and being in community to sustain ourselves. And I think that's what I would say to folks. Thank you all so, so much. There are many other questions. I hope you'll follow up with the links that folks have shared and resources folks have shared um, and contact people at your universities, your resource centers at your universities uh, and beyond to get there some specific questions about how to mark these bathrooms and things like that. Um, and that you continue to do the work, right? Everyone here has spoken about how important that is. Um, so I want to, to thank Andy Cofino, Rick Davis, and, and, and Huang for being here today. Um, and on the behalf, on behalf of the University of California, thank you all for joining us and for the UC Alumni Career Network. Uh, hosting this seminar, this webinar. Um, it was a pleasure to con connect virtually with everyone here. I'm hoping that we get more and more of these opportunities to center gender equity in our conversations. Um, I'd like to thank you all again, Andy and, and Rick for being here, for your generosity and your commitment to this work and for the, the, the labors that are seen and unseen that you all are efforting every day. I hope everyone will take a few minutes to provide feedback on the event. There will be a survey link sent to you. Uh, so there, some of your questions actually could be great reflected there to us and the feedback you provide will help improve the series. So thank you for, for in advance for completing those. Uh, you can visit ucal.us forward slash ACN for recordings of past webinars and Again, thank you all for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day in this glorious coming out day. Come on out, people. Come on out. <laughs> Any uh, Anything further from anyone? A snap clap? I'll just say feel free to reach out to us. Uh, I think we are all resources. Um, so yeah, and I think folks can share our contact information and things. I think the clerk did that at some point. Yes, and thank you so much, Sage, for moderating. 
some pleasure. Beautiful. Have a great Thank day. Thank you, Sage. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right. Enjoy your day. Thank you all.